I'd like to start by pointing out a few references for what I was talking about yesterday. There are a set of excellent lecture notes by David Tong. You can find them on his website. There's also a big review by Van Doren and Van Nieuwenhuizen, which has uh, a lot of computational details in case you're interested in the more uh, computational side of the subject. And then there are these two papers which I mentioned uh, as a reference for the original brain theory construction by Michael Douglas. So let me briefly review where we were yesterday, where we left off. So we were trying to study the instant on equations, which um, if you solve these equations, you've automatically solved the equations of motion. And moreover, you find a finite action configuration where the action is proportional to the topological charge of the object. And for a given topological charge, K, we found that the solutions to these equations, they're not unique. You have various continuous parameters that parameterize your solution, and these parameters we called collective coordinates. So in particular, I wrote down uh, the solution for an SU2 gauge group with instant on charge one, and we saw that there were eight collective coordinates, more generally, there will be four k n bosonic collective coordinates uh, when you solve this equation. Now, we also saw that these collective coordinates, which are these continuous parameters on which the solutions depend, were in a one-to-one -one correspondence with so-called zero modes. So the zero modes, they were really normalizable solutions to the linearized e field equations for the fluctuations. So what we did is we wrote the gauge field as some classical solution, where by classical solution I just mean a solution to this equation, it depended on these continuous variables, and we studied a fluctuation around this solution, and then there were two conditions for these fluctuations. First of all, it needed to satisfy, as I just said, these linearized field equations, and second of all, you want to prevent that this is a pure gauge transformation, so you want to uh, make sure that this is orthogonal to all possible gauge transformations. So this problem gives you, well, it, it's defined by these two equations I just described. You find what goes under the name of these zero modes, and they were in one-to-one -one correspondence to the collective coordinates. Moreover, there were not just bosonic zero modes in the, in the problem. As soon as the theory you're studying, in which you're studying these instanton configurations, also has fermions, there will be also fermionic zero modes, which are defined in essentially the same way. They're again solutions to the linearized field equations around this background, but now not for a fluctuation since fermions classically don't uh, have a profile, so it's just for the fermion itself. So in general, when you have some generic interacting field theory, you'll have these two types of zero modes, and in fact, when the interacting field theory possesses supersymmetry, these two types of zero modes, they're really paired up by supersymmetry. So we showed that in an instant on background, part of the supersymmetry is preserved, and that preserved supersymmetry will act on these zero modes. It will organize these zero modes in supersymmetric multiplets of the supersymmetry algebra, which is preserved in this background. So Susie will pair the bosonic and fermionic zero modes. So in particular, if we are studying n equals two supersymmetric theories, the supersymmetry preserved in an instanton background was um, two-dimensional n equals 0, 0,4 supersymmetry, but dimensional reduced to uh, well, to zero D. So this was all still within the four-dimensional quantum field theory, but then we made something of a conceptual jump. We tried to start thinking about a configuration 
in R4. So we have some instant time configuration in R4. The gauge field in this R4 is essentially looking like this. So it depends on these collective coordinates. And of course, it also depends on the position in this R4. And then what I suggested to do is we add an extra dimension to our space. We still look at an instant time configuration in R4, but while it moves in what we may call time, I'm going to let the collective coordinates depend on that coordinate time. So we have in every slice in time, we consider an instant on configuration, but while we move in time, I'm going to allow these corrective coordinates to depend on, on where in time we are. So if we write the action for such a configuration, so now I'm in 4D plus this extra 1D direction, we have the time integral and the usual space integral of the Young Mills term plus a lot more. If we take this action and we plug in this configuration, it is clear that uh, as far as the four-dimensional integral is concerned, you will just notice that at every point in time you have an instant time configuration. We already know what that integrated to. It integrated essentially to this uh, topological charge. But we will pick up various time derivatives because these collective coordinates are dependent on time. So if you do this exercise, you will actually find that this five-dimensional integral reduces to <coughs> some integral along time, where a thing that enters here will contain various derivatives, or will contain dynamics of these collective coordinates, which now depend on time. So this I wrote yesterday as well. You should generically, generically expect that the result here is some sigma model with, as its target space, precisely the modelized space of instantons. So let me, somewhere here, I should say that these collective coordinates, they define for you some modelized space. So both the bosonic ones and the fermionic ones, they come together, define some modelized space. And this is the metric on that modelized space. We defined it yesterday. And in general, you should expect, if you do this procedure, to find a one-dimensional theory that tells you what the dynamics is of the motion essentially in this modelized space while this instant on configuration moves forward in time. Sorry, and uh, the initial, uh, initial five-dimensional action, it was an uh, action of, <coughs> action of uh, five dimensional n equal one theory? Well, yeah, let's just think for a second that I'm just doing the pure Yang Mills case again, but you can in principle complete it or try to complete it. And what, what, and what is the fields, like five dimensional fields in which was absent in four dimensions? In five dimensions? Yeah, I'm doing five d for the n equals two, so there is a completion to n equals one if you like. But there, there are other fields which was not present in four dimensional. No, if I do 5dn equals 1 in 5d, well, 5dn equals 1 reduces to 4dn equals 2. But we have d4 to d4 x, dt d Sorry? You have dt and d to the 4 x? Yes. Oh, so you do 5dn? Yes. Oh, okay. In principle, no. Right, right, right. But the completion, well, anyway. For example, vector potential contains five components in five dimensions. Sure. Yes. And what is the fifth component? Choose it to be zero. Okay, it's done. So through this procedure, we land on some quantum mechanics describing the dynamics of the model I. And we would really like to study this object a bit better. It's clear that this description as a sigma model into the target, uh, into the modelized space is not all that useful. So instead, we started thinking about brain pictures that maybe provide a more convenient description of precisely this one dimensional theory. So let me not repeat all this brain theory stuff, but let me just tell you the answer. So if you want to study 
the world volume theory of an instanton in a four-dimensional n equals two theory, it will be given by well, by a quiver gauge theory. So k is the instanton charge. I have a uk gauge group. I'll define what dotted lines and solid lines mean in a second. So we find this type of a quiver. I drew it using two-dimensional n equals 0, 0,2 notations. But you should really think to get to that picture, you should dimension reduce it by uh, one dimension. So in this 2D n equals 0, 0,2 notation, the solid arrows are chiral multiplets. So correspond to chiral multiplets. The dashed lines are Fermi multiplets. And of course, this corresponds to a vector multiplet. So let me remind you of the field content of these things. In the chiral multiplet, you have a pair of complex scalars and a pair of left-moving fermions. In the Fermi multiplet, you have a pair of right-moving fermions and two auxiliary fields. And finally, the vector multiplet, which sits hidden in here, contains, of course, the gauge field and a pair of right-moving fermions together with some auxiliary field. So this is the two-dimensional description. If you want to reduce to the 1D description, it will look essentially the same. But in particular, this gauge field, one of its components will become a scalar. And if eventually we may want to look just at the zero-dimensional world volume theory, then you pick up to two scalars over here. So we would like to study this world volume theory. This is really the object that describes the motion in the modelized space. And as I mentioned yesterday, one of the branches of the vacuum manif manifold of this thing is precisely the modelized space we're after. Of course, for the specific case of an n equals 2 theory with gauge group SUN. And in this case, I chose 2n fundamental flavors. So these correspond to the 2n fundamental flavors split in two groups of n. If you have different matter content, you can try to change these numbers. Are there any questions up to this point? This was essentially the review. OK, so let me then go back to my original problem. We were localizing on the four sphere. And we had chosen some localizing supercharge Q, which had the property that it's squared to two rotations. Plus an SU2R Carton generator plus a mass plus a gauge transformation. So here, m dot f means the flavor symmetry acts on whatever field you're acting, and the coefficient of the, the action is a mass, and same over here. So this was the supercharge we chose. Let me just remind you that we're on S4b, which I gave coordinates, or which I parameterized at least. as follows, where the b was defined as the square root of l over l tilde. So this j12 is the rotation of these two coordinates. j34 is the rotation over here. And as I said, r is the su2 r carton. So this was our localizing supercharge on the four sphere. In particular, this is how it acts close to the north pole where the instanton lives. And in fact, part of this preserved supersymmetry that in the instanton background, I mean, we know that the instantons are solutions of the localization procedure with respect to this Q. So certainly this Q is preserved in the instanton background. And in fact, it acts on precisely this, um, this world volume theory, or it's one of the superchargers that still pr is preserved in this, uh, in this quiver. So in particular, I should be able to think of this supercharge at the level of this quiver. 
So there should in that quiver there is a supercharge which squares to exa exactly this thing. But let me slightly rewrite the square just to have more conventional notations. So I, I didn't do anything. I just took the sum and the difference of these two terms. But now it's conventionally, this thing is conventionally called JR. This thing is called JL. These are really, well, it doesn't matter what they are really. This thing is called J. They're all just names. So at the end of the day, on this world volume theory, I have a supercharge that acts like so. But now I also added an extra term which corresponds to uh, gauge transformations with respect to this guy. So, Q is there is a Q in this theory which squares to this thing. Where in this zero dimensional theory, this J and this J left are really thought of as flavor symmetries. And this, this is still of flavor as well. This is also flavor from the point of view of the zero dimensional theory. So this G is really corresponding to this flavor symmetry. And then finally, we have the UK, which is represented over here. So the task we have to perform now is to assign the quantum numbers under these flavor symmetries to the various multiplets which appear in this quiver. So we have the various 0, 0,2 multiplets. Um, <coughs> we try to keep it somewhat close. So we have, in the brain picture, we had D0, D4 strings, where these D0, D4 strings, they gave, for example, this Fermi multiplet. Maybe I should do it like this. Let me call this Fermi multiplet number one. It comes from over here. So this has charges under this J of zero and under J left of zero. Now I should mention that in the brain theory picture we had, all these charges act geometrically. So you should be able to figure out what exactly are the charges. And I will just give you the answer. So we had two chiral multiplets that came from the D0, D4, two strings. So those are really these two. Chiral multiplet one, chiral multiplet two, five, Fermi multiplet two, Fermi multiplet three, chiral three, chiral four. So chiral multiplet one and chiral multiplet two you can verify have charges a half, a half, and zero, zero. Fermi multiplet number two is similar to this guy. And then finally, we had a vector multiplet sitting there. We have Fermi multiplet number three and Chiron multiplet three and four. Let me just give the answers, zero. 0, 0, 1, 0, a half, a half, a half, 
minus a half. OK, so this was not very illuminating. I just gave you the answer. These are the charges of the various multiplets under these two flavor symmetries. Since they're flavor symmetries, all the elements of these multiplets should have the same charge. At least when I think of it as a zero dimensional thing. So now, we have all the information we can possibly hope to have about this quiver in order to localize it with respect to precisely this supercharge. So this is a localization of well, pick your dimension. We can do it, say, in 1D n equals 2, where the n equals 2 is thought of as dimensionally reducing from the 0, 0,2. Or you can do it, well, we can do it in this dimension, and then we reduce it to 0D. Um, well, you do it however you want. I will just tell you the answer. I think, I hope that Francesco will tell you more about localizing the elliptic genus. That computation is the most similar to the computation you're supposed to do to compute the partition function of that world volume theory. So let me just give you the answer. So the procedure is, of course, the same. We have a queue. We study the BPS configurations. We evaluate the classical actions. If they give any contribution, we evaluate one loop determinants. And we integrate over the entire BPS locus. So the integral in this case is over the over, uh, an element valued in the cartel of that UK gauge group. So we have K integration variables. And what we integrate is a whole slew of one loop determinants. So in this computation, the classical actions they evaluate to zero. In fact, they're all Q exact. So we shouldn't expect any contributions from there. And indeed, the result just contains one loop stuff. It contains one loop stuff from the various elements in this quiver, which I, okay, which I again denote by their, their brain names, just to be brief. So we find one loop determinants for the d0, d0 strings, which is really for this vector multiplet and, uh, well, all this adjoint stuff, essentially. This is all the adjoint stuff. This is for this Fermi multiplet, one of the Fermi multiplets that sticks out to one of these n's. This is for that other Fermi multiplet. And this, finally, is for the pair of chiral multiplets that connect to the node, which is really to be identified with the four-dimensional gauge group. So that's why this guy depends on the gauge parameter, and these two depend on flavor symmetry parameters of the four-dimensional theory. So in this picture, these m's coupled to the four-dimensional flavor symmetry, and these are represented by these m and m tildes, which are really the flavor symmetries rotating here and here, while this phi over here, capital phi, couples to the four-dimensional gauge group, which is really that box n up there. And finally, this little phi, as I was mentioning, is the parameter of this UK gauge group. So this is uh, a computation you can do. You co can compute these one-loop determinants one by one. You multiply them, and then you perform the integral, where I wrote some funny letters here, JK. It's a particular residue prescription that you need to imp impose when computing this integral. So this res this, this Various ingredients have various poles, and this JK prescription tells you precisely which poles you should pick and which poles you should avoid. Um, OK, it, it will be somewhat useful. So sorry, I should have written this before the lecture to actually have the explicit expressions. So let me quickly provide you with these expressions. And in fact, then you will see why it was useful to have this entire table of charges. At least intuitively, you can understand where these ingredients come from. So the D0, D0 strings, as I said, it's everything that is adjoint. That is this entire list. For the vector multiplet, we had charge 0 for both of these flavor symmetries. Uh, 
but of course the vector multiplet is adjoint valued under this phi, so we get phi ij, which is shorthand notation for phi i minus phi j. So this is like the root structure that appears when you act on this adjoint value thing. And the prime means that in this product over i and j, you should omit the terms when i is equal to j. Okay, so you can really see this 0, 0 appear here simply because there's nothing else. We evaluated the one loop determinant and we had a 0 here, a 0 here, 0 here, 0 here. We just got stuff from here, which is reflected here. Now, for this guy, this guy comes from the Fermi multiplet. The Fermi multiplet carries charge 1 under J, charge 0 under JL. And you can indeed again see that reflected here. This B plus B inverse comes precisely from here. J is 1, so we pick up a B plus B inverse. Again, it's an adjoint value thing, so we pick up this phi i minus phi j from over here. Similarly for these two chiral multiplets, they carry charge half half and half minus a half. So we get this times a half plus this times a half. That is this B, plus, uh, that is this B over here. And similarly, half minus a half gives you this B inverse. So you really see that this one loop determinant is not all that mysterious. And in fact, the, the pattern recognition I'm doing between this the one loop determinant and these charges is if you actually do the actual computation, you will see that this is precisely how these things arise. So now we understand the pattern, we can easily write down the other contributions. For example, for these, for these chiral multiplets that carry charge a half on the J, that means that we should expect a V plus B inverse. Sorry. So I'm writing the Fermi multiplets. Sorry. For these Fermi multiplets, we don't expect anything. But these Fermi multiplets, they are charged under this type of flavor symmetry. So you get you get phi i because they're fundamental under the gauge group, and they're fundamental under these flavor symmetries which gives you this type of expression. And similarly for the, the other ones, and then finally, we have these two chiral multiplets. The chiral multiplets contribute bosonic uh, fluctuations, whereas the Fermi multiplets contribute uh, fermionic fluctuations. That's why the fermionic Fermi multiplets give you stuff in the numerator, but the chiral multiplets will give you stuff in the denominator. So this comes from these two chiral multiplets. You finally get, again, they're bifundamental under the gauge group and this top node over there, which was identified with the gauge node in the four-dimensional theory, so we get a result like so, where you see the charge one-half reflected in this extra term. Oh, I'm sorry. This should be, this is three, and this is two. Okay. Three is, three is, well, okay, sorry, the names are not optimal, but these two, these two Fermi multiplets, they correspond to these two contributions. So these two, the two Fermis sticking out are these two guys, D0, D0 was all the adjoint stuff sitting over here. And then finally, this stuff comes from these two chiral multiples. So, this is the current configuration. It's going to be some sticky, but not like the past. Yeah, of course, it will be equivalent. So, let me, maybe I should have drawn the brain configuration. So, we had ND4 brains, another ND4 brains, a third set of D4 brains. We had KD0 brains. This stack I called one, this two, this three, and we have all the strings connecting things. Okay, very good. Maybe say one more time 
Okay, so it's just when you do the uh, when you do the localization, you're going to compute these one-loop determinants of quadratic fluctuations. There's a, a lot of cancellations between uh, bosonic mode and fermionic modes, but in particular, you can see that the Fermi multiplet has two fermions and some auxiliary stuff. It's these two fermions that will contribute fluctuations. They're fermionic fluctuations, so you get stuff in the numerator. The fermionic one-loop determinant sits in the numerator. Similarly here for these chiral multiplets, there are two scalars and there are two fermions, but it turns out that contributions are such that only the, uh, the scalars have a leftover contribution that sits here in the denominator. Yeah. You do the computation. It's not, it's not supposed to be obvious. But you see, it has these two fermions sitting there, and those guys contribute. I mean, the, the modes coming from the fermions are not cancelled by modes coming from the, fer uh, from the bosons. Not all fermionic modes are cancelled by bosonic modes. There are some leftover modes, and they give you this. Volker, do you happen to know how, so the, in, in 2D 2.2, as uh, Francesco was explaining at some point, uh, the vector multiplet gives rise to uh, the, the field strength in lies in the twisted parallel. Uh, could it be that the vector multiplet field strength here lies in the Fermi multiplet? Would you explain? Uh, yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's a better explanation, indeed. Oh, the question was um, whether it happens to be so that a 0, 0,2 vector multiplet is equivalent to a 0, 0,2 Fermi multiplet. And indeed, that, that is the case. And that's why you can understand in another way why the vector multiplet contribution gives fermionic, looks like a fermionic determinant. Okay, with some effort, oh, we wrote down a final expression for the partition function of the world volume theory of an instanton of charge K in an n equals 2 superconformal field theory. So at this point, we are really, we're really done. We have that object. I wrote it as a zero-dimensional, uh, well, the result I wrote is for a zero-dimensional computation. We have this zero-dimensional object, this point-like instanton sitting at the North Pole. There's a similar expression for the point like anti-instantons at the South Pole. And the only thing we need to do is add up all possible topological charges with a proper weighting factor, which comes from the classical action in four dimensions. So this is the total, let me call it, I don't know what to call it. So this is the total contribution from all possible topological charges. We have such a contribution and we have a similar contribution for the anti-instantons. So this is the extra ingredient that we didn't know quite yet when we were writing down the answer for the localization. So we had this integral over the lo uh, smooth localization locus. It, uh, it was parameterized by what I have called over there capital phi. So let me keep that notation. We have capital phi, which is the integration variable. Then we had well, now we have these two instant contributions. We had a classical action. Which I think had coefficient like so. And then we had the f one loop determinants from the four dimensional fields. We had hypermultiplet stuff and vector multiplet stuff. These two guys were expressed in terms of upsilon functions. And this is really now the final the final thing. So this depends on phi, this depends on phi, m, and m tilde to keep notation from there. And these two guys, they depend on, well, the dependence here is on capital phi, capital m, and m tilde. Because of course we integrated out to little phi. And everything depends on b and b inverse. q is the instant on counting parameter. Um, I got it by evaluating the classical action, and it is really q is e to the 2 pi i tau, where tau is the holomorphic coupling, so it is 
theta over 2 pi plus 4 pi i over g young mills, I think. G young mills squared. So if you take an instant on and you want to evaluate the only terms, sorry, let me do this over here. So the only terms relevant to uh, evaluate the classical action on an instant on configuration are <coughs> the, the Yang Mills action and this topological term. This, well, there's traces. This thing had coefficient i theta over. over 8 pi squared. This guy has coefficient, I think, 1 over 2 g young mil squared. And now we know that this integral precisely gives a topological charge. So this is precisely k. Now star f, since we're looking at an instanton, is of course the same as just f. So I can kill the star here. Then this thing will be proportional to k, but not quite. You need to take into account these factors of 8 pi squared. So this thing is 8 pi squared, and then you put it all together, and you should recover this combination as a counting parameter, where the k keeps track of the topological charge. Okay, so we know in principle the answer. Let me just uh, mention that you will typically see this answer expressed in a slightly different form. Let me just mention how that comes about if you try to compute these integrals. So if you're familiar with instanton partition functions, you typically see them expressed as a sum over Young diagrams and then stuff. So where does that sum over Young diagrams come from? Well, it comes from actually performing this integral I wrote up there. So the JK prescription, I will not explain it in any detail, but for my purposes, it's enough to know that it will instruct me to consider the poles consider poles of negatively charged stuff. Negatively charged fields. So in particular, what does that mean for that integral? If you look at, oh no. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I removed the integrands, it seems. Oh, excellent. OK, so if you want to look for negatively charged stuff, you can see that one of these chiral multiplets, it has a minus sign in front of its phi, little phi. This minus sign is precisely the gauge charge. And we're looking for negatively charged objects. So that guy is one of, the, one of the poles we should take into account. This is a pole that comes from a negatively charged field. And the JK prescription tells you, take that pole. So we have a pole from that equation. Let me just write it. So the pole from that equation, from, from this guy, gives me, well, you have a pole if this equation is satisfied. So if one of the phi i's happens to be equal to this, you will have a pole from over there. Now from this adjoint stuff over here, this is phi i minus phi j, this is phi i minus phi j, so you see again minuses pop up. So from here and here, we will also find poles of positively charged objects, just because, well, at the level of patterns, you see a minus sign in the expression, and you find two more pole equations, which look like so. So if you want to compute this integral, 
we have to we have to pick up all poles which solve these equations. We need to solve these equations such that we have k linearly independent solutions for these phi's. So okay, let's try. Let's try. So the first thing, these guys they need as an input, they eat as an input already one expression in terms of little phi. So we don't have a phi yet when we when we're starting to construct the pole, so we should start with this guy. So step number one is start with start with an equation, start with equation A, which in particular means you should choose one of these capital A indices for which you take phi i to be equal. So this starting point, let me denote that just with this little box. In here I chose in here I chose phi i to be equal to i capital phi i plus a half b plus b inverse. So that's always step one if you are looking for a new pole of which you would like to compute the residue of that integrand. So step number two, step number two could be, well, I choose this equation again, and then I would start drawing what I call yb, you'll see in a second y, and I would have a new box, and then, okay, so this is not, it's possible, but let me be a bit more adventurous and try to use poles b and c. So every time I choose a b, I need as an input already an, a phi expression that is already on some pole location. So we already have that. We have this phi expression. It sits on some pole equation. I can shove that in here. Then I add a b and I find another expression for a new pole. When I do that, let me just draw a box over here to indicate I took, took this one and I used equation b. So every time you use b, every time you use b, I'm going to propose as a rule, add box to the right of the input. So this thing needs input. So that means that input already had a box, and you put a box to the right of that guy. So that's what I did here. I added this box to the right of the guy I already had. And then this guy will, of course, be precisely this expression plus an extra b. So at the moment, we picked two Two, well, two variables phi on a pole location. We should do this game k times. Every time you use b, we're going to add a box in this picture to the right. Now, what happens when you choose uh, option c? You're going to add a box to the bottom. So if I choose option c, I take again this pole as an input. I add b inverse. This defines a pole of that integrand. And this guy then sits at a location defines a pole location as follows. And you keep doing this game. But it's not an unrestricted game. You cannot get any arbitrary shape of this, of this, this box configuration simply because you see over here, this thing becomes 0 as soon as phi i is equal to phi j. As soon as any i different from j is such that phi i is equal to phi j, you get a zero from here. Similarly here, as soon as phi i is equal to phi j up to b plus b inverse, you're also getting a zero. So that means that if you, have a, if you had found in this list of pole configurations things which are either equal or differ by b plus b inverse, you really didn't have that pole because it was cancelled against the zero. So what does that mean in these pictures? It means that It means that if I have, well, if I delete this box, say I didn't choose, didn't choose this box, I just chose those two boxes, and I try to add a box to the bottom of this, meaning that I try to input the thing over here, which was i phi a plus a half b plus b inverse plus b. Say I try to input this pole in equation c. That would mean that I need to add another b inverse to define the pole location in that integrand. So this would be naively would naively define a pole location like this. 
but this is precisely equal to this up to b plus b inverse, so it will cancel against that zero, so this is really not a pole configuration. So if you think a little bit, then you will figure out that the only configurations of boxes you're really allowed to have look like look like so, they look like Young diagrams. So this was a Young diagram based on choosing this pole once where I chose the index A and then I use these other poles to complete. But you can of course choose multiple, multiple times number A so you have a Young diagram that is labeled by A, you will get one that is labeled by B and so forth. You keep doing this game until you have defined precisely K linearly independent pole locations which do not hit zeros, which is implemented by having this kind of a shape. So at, at the end of the day, when you actually try to perform this integral, you will find an expression that looks like a sum over vectors of Young diagrams such that the number of boxes in that Young, in the so that's the total number of boxes in this collection of Young diagrams is precisely equal to k. If you have pre precisely k boxes, you have precisely k poles, and you're doing a k-dimensional integral, so that's good. That will define you something, and then you can compute the residues and fill in these dots. So this is perhaps the more standard expression of the instant on partition function. It's a sum over all boxes with, uh, over all Young diagrams of some integrand. So over here, this sum over k, if you like, I can refine it internally. It will be a sum over Young diagrams restricted to have k boxes of this thing, and then this integrand is what we were just defining. Or I can just say I have a big fat sum over all type of Young diagrams, and now you need to think a little bit more what this integrand should be, but you can figure that out, or you just look it up in Nikita Nekrasov's paper. So I think at this point we have uh, achieved the localization on the fourth sphere in all details. Uh, well, all details that I was willing to mention. I haven't computed for you these one loop determinants in great detail, but you can do so. We know the instant on partition pieces. We know the classical action. So this is the S4 partition function. Are there any questions about this computation? Yes. Yeah, somehow this can be was like this way into the page group of UN, not SUN. So S, well, because in the original figure of by HTTP, you point out that you are from. I don't understand. Um, okay, that's true. And Maybe we can talk about it later, but there is a trick that you can do at the level of that integrand to take care of the difference between UN and SUN, or you just do like AGT and you pull out some U1 factors. Um, the trick has to do with this thing is, well, it's not really wall crossing invariant, and um, you need to make sure it's wall crossing invariant. If you do that, then the claim is that this thing actually does produce a SUN result. Yes? We have an interpretation in terms of permutation groups now that we have the Young diagrams here, is it a coincidence that they see? Sorry, say again? I mean, in Young diagrams, you also see them with, but with um, permutation groups. Is there also an interpretation in terms of permutation groups here, or is it a coincidence that these Young diagrams appear here? I wouldn't say it's a coincidence, but I'm not sure if I have an answer off the top of my head about permutations. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was that we ended up with the sum over Young diagrams, and Young diagrams are related to permutations or partitions. There's a lot of things that are labeled by Young diagrams. The question was, does that have a meaning in this context? But at the moment, I'm just going to say that it's a convenient way to characterize the poles of this integrand. Next week, you should hear a more feel theoretic understanding of what, of why this Young diagram should show up when you do the, the actual integration over the moduli space as defined by the ADHM constraints. Okay.
If there's no more questions, let me start with some new topic. Sorry, say again. Jeffrey Kerwan. It's two names, Francis Kerwan and I forget the first name of Jeffrey. Okay, so the new topic I would like to talk about is, is the following. So just now I had the result for a localization computation of the S4 partition function. We did localization on S4, but to do localization on S4, there were really two choices we uh, made. The first choice was which super supercharge to choose to localize. We chose a particular one that had these two rotations, this SU2 R carton generator. And the other choice is which localizing fermion or fermionic functional we choose. So in this computation that we just finished, I chose the canonical one, which Francesco also chose this morning. It was a sum over all fermions of the variation of the fermion dagger, where the dagger is defined with respect to some good choice of reality properties, times the fermion again. So really, there's two things I could try to do to get perhaps more useful, oh well, not more useful, other results for the S4 partition function. I could change the choice of Q, and I could change the choice of V. Let me stick to the same Q, although it's very interesting to consider different choices of Q. And if you choose right, you will be able to get chiral algebras, which you will hear about next week from Balt. At least the chiral algebra part. I'm not sure about the localization part. So in this uh, next topic, I would like to change V. So recall that all we're doing into the, to the path integral is we have this integral over all the fields, we have the action, and we're adding, adding something Q exact, such that the bosonic part of, this, of, of the Q variation of this thing, uh, of this V, is actually positive definite. So here you see that manifestly this positive defini definiteness, but whatever V I choose, it's still as long as it's entering in a Q exact way, it should not change the answer. So whatever I will do now, or modifying this thing or just choosing something new altogether, I will not change the answer. The answer will always be the same, but the representation of the answer will change, perhaps, if I choose V cleverly enough. So let me choose such a clever V. I'm going to stay, or keep this term, but I add something new. I add to this expression, the trace over the gauge indices of some age, which I'll explain in a second. So I add this to the deformation action, where here lambda and lambda tilde are the gaugini, so they're elements of the n equals 2 vector multiplet. I contract the spinner indices with the killing spinners. So these guys, they describe, they describe my particular Q. So Q is described by uh, this pair of killing spinners. I use them to contract the spinner indices. Both of them carry an SU2R index. I symmetrize that SU2R index. And then I take this expression and I multiply it with an object H, which is a triplet triplet of SU2R, 
said differently, these indices are also symmetrized. And h is just some arbitrary functional. At the moment, I'm not going to specify what h is. It's just something depending on bosonic fields. So this is some function of bosonic fields. So good. I chose this to be my v. If I act with a q, I'm making it q exact on the nose because, after all, I'm acting with the q. So this is it's a legal thing to do. The only question I should answer now is if I can actually run the localization machine because, as I just mentioned, you also need to make sure that the bosonic part of this qv is positive semi-definite. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I can. So, <laughs> well, you see it in, in like five minutes. If it's not clear why I chose this thing, then um, I'll get back to your question. Good. So I should also mention that S4, as we already noticed, is a somewhat complicated localization computation. When I'm doing what will turn out to be Higgs branch localization, it's not going to get any easier. But fortunately, Francesco already announced that he will perform uh, a different lo Higgs branch localization computation on the two sphere, I think. There, the details will be easier to follow than what I'm doing, but I'll do my best to at least sketch how the computation works in this case. But we'll notice that somewhat complicated configurations appear in integrate ways, and that complication is not present when you do this game in lower dimensions. So, as I was saying, we would like this property to be true, but if you look at it, if I'm going to act with Q on my new V, it's this sum over fermions of something that is manifestly positive definite. But then I have this sum so I'm restricting to the bosonic piece. Then I have this, this trace over this thing. H was something bosonic. So if I vary it, I make something fermionic, which is not what I want. So I should really vary the gay genie over there. So, OK, this is the Q of V, and we would like this to be positive definite. Now, it's obvious that this is not, not quite the case. This is, but this, given that I refuse to specify what H is at the moment, there's no reason why this should even be positive definite. So it seems like I'm in a little bit of trouble if I would like to use this for a localization computation. But that is actually only superficially so. Because remember that the variations of the gay genie, it has a lot of stuff, but in particular, it has this auxiliary field term. This triplet of auxiliary fields appears in the variation of Q of lambda, and similarly in the variation of lambda tilde, I get a lot of stuff, and the auxiliary field again. So that means that when I use that variation here and here, this term will be will be linear in the auxiliary field. There will be dij times some, some stuff. In particular, it will, roughly speaking, look like dij times hij with some fermion bilinear <laughs> coming from the contractions <laughs> over here. This thing, when psi is actually also the gay geno, you see that this thing will be quadratic in D. Since both variations will contain these types of terms, so you can get quadratic terms from here. You also have some linear terms, and you have some linear terms from here. Now, in all this, the auxiliary field, of course, doesn't enter with the derivative. It's just a pure Gaussian integral, and we can perform that integral. So we can perform this Gaussian integral exactly, which essentially means you, we solve for the equation of motion of dij in this thing, and we 
substitute it back. So the equation of motion is is this. Dij is equal to minus a half times this object minus i times phi 1 w. So let me remind you what phi 1 and w mean. So we had two complex scalars, phi and phi bar. They're complex, so I can try to parameterize them in terms of two real scalars, which is what I'm doing over here. So phi 1 and phi 2 are two real scalars, and I expressed phi and phi bar in terms of them, and one of these real scalars appears over here. And now if you're paying a lot of attention, you notice that this is quite a funny reality property, if you like. The complex conjugate of this is definitely not this, but yet when I define this dagger, I will precisely say that phi 1 and phi 2 are real. So you see this is what Francesco was also mentioning this morning, the reality properties you impose and doing these types of integrals are not necessarily the natural ones. So phi 1 and phi 2 are real, and phi and phi bar are not each other complex conjugate, but there is an extra minus sign. So that is what this phi 1 is. Now this w, well, concretely on S4, you can think of w just as being some 2 by 2 matrix. It's symmetric, and its entries are simply this, where r is the radius of my round S4. So on round S4, you just have this type of a matrix. It's very concrete. But you remember from last time, we had a definition of w in terms of this S. So roughly, but then I need to define S. So anyway, look at last time's lecture to see what w is in terms of abstract symbols. So OK, I can do this. I can integrate our d. At the moment, that doesn't seem to have bothered me all that much. But the miracle, yes, please. But now, US is equal to zero. And then, uh, now, once you get problems with the controls, you can show it. With the Kunan, that's the problem. Because if you integrate out the security, then you <coughs> are in an option. Uh, the question is, OK, I integrated out dij, and the question or the worry is that when I integrated out dij, my um, transformation rules went off shell. That's the worry. But really, I know how they went well off shell, so to speak. dij is just this, so I just substitute this in the, in the transformation rules, and I'm still fine. So at this, OK, maybe a different answer to your question is, before doing all this nonsense, I have guaranteed you that this thing will not change the answer simply because it's a Q exact information. Whether it's positive definite or not, that doesn't matter for the argument that there is no dependence on this parameter t over there. Once I am at that point, then I can start fooling around with performing integrations like this. And I know how these integrals will affect my transformation rules because I will just substitute this in the transformation rule. Yes? Are you happy? Sorry, and, uh, and the initial action is also dependent on the... Yeah, but, okay, that's true. So in principle, here I just looked at, I should have this parameter t floating around. Well, no, qv is this, but in the action there is an extra parameter t. So everything I wrote here is dominant over whatever you get from the original action when I send t to infinity. So you're right, in principle, from the original action, there will be extra contributions here, but they will be suppressed by 1 over t. But um, if, if, I, if I substitute that, that contribution back into the qb, I will get some contribution which would go to the zero order on qt. This back in here? Yes, if I... I uh, if, uh, oh, you mean the, the, the extra stuff? Well, maybe it's 1 over t squared. It, it works. Um, it's probably 1 over t squared because of the argument you just said. OK, so I'm doing this. I'm integrating out this dij, plug it back in here, and then there's a lot of work to be done. But at the end of the day, you will find almost miraculously that adding this weird extra term after integrating out dij, 
still gives you a positive definite answer. So you get still a sum of squares or mod squares of stuff. So the squares are typically from the vector multiplet stuff because they are more real than the hyper multiplets. But anyway, so you get a sum of manifestly positive definite things. Of course, I didn't specify all the dot dot dot, but you'll have to believe me. If you don't believe me, I can give you the reference. You can look at this paper. where we spell out all the details in this particular case. Or you can look at uh, the S3 version or the S2 version or the S3 times S1 version. It's always the same moral story where you find that this particular type of choice gives you a sum of positive definite things. Now, let me come back to Ellie's question. The question was, why do I choose this thing? Now, the reason is now that you see in this equation of motion for dij, I get dij is equal to hij, and let me ignore this stuff for a second. So really, if I'm going to choose hij, which roughly speaking looks like the moment map, then I'm imposing vacuum equations. And this is exactly what I want. Is that clear? Sort of. It will become clearer later. So if, yeah, if I chose a, choose e hij to be essentially what goes under the name of the moment map, Ignoring this piece for a second, I'm imposing vacuum equations, and that is where I want to go. I want to get rid of this integral we had in the original computation, and I want to replace it with a sum over vacua. And this type of equation will precisely tell me, or already hints that that is what we will achieve by choosing this particular deformation. So the trick is really to make sure that if you integrate out d, that you get d is equal to what you can set equal to a moment map. Okay, this is uh, this is good. And now let me specify a bit let me try to specify what are these ingredients that enter there. Of course it's an annoying computation which would only waste time if I do it live. So this is the result. So it's very explicit. That's basically the message you should take home. So you see here, HIJ enters in these rules. If I didn't, if I hadn't included HIJ, if HIJ were zero, then these pieces would be gone, and then you would just be staring at your original localization equations on S4. So now I added this hij and it enters contracted with this tensor theta, which I defined over here. It's some bilinear in killing spinners. Can you die it slowly? Yes. So, as well. So again, phi 1 and phi 2 are the real uh, scalars defining phi and phi bar. And we already sort of remember this equation. We know that on S4, the localization locus was constant values for phi 1. And this is the equation that precisely imposes this constantness condition. So phi 1 needs to be constant in the original computation. So in the original computation, that means I ignore these two terms that are manifestly proportional to hij. This equation just constrains phi 2. It's not obvious that phi 2 needs to be 0 just from this equation, but if you later combine it with this equation, you will see that phi 2 needs to be 0 again in the original localization computation. If I want, if I do need to commute, that's that's fine. And then these are really these are the juicy equations. Let me ignore the hij pieces for a second. Then, in fact, you can simplify these equations a bit more to find precisely the localization locus on S4. So, if you ignore this piece, you can play with Fields identities to simplify this little mess, and then you find that phi two should be zero. The field strengths should be zero. And that was the localization logs for the vector multiplet, which we found in the original localization computation. Again, you've noticed this feature here, S and S tilde, they're proportional to xi squared and xi tilde squared. These guy va guys vanished at the North Pole and South Pole, respectively. So at North Pole and South Pole, we find these weaker equations. 
because the coefficient is already zero, you don't need to manifestly impose at North Pole and South Pole that these guys are separately zero. So at North Pole and South Pole, we find uh, instantons and anti-instantons. This is all still for the original computation. Now, for the, my new computation, I have these two extra terms sitting in these transformation rules, and they mess up the last part of the argument I just gave. You cannot do these field rearrangements anymore to argue that phi 2 should be 0 and that the field strength should be 0, just because you have these extra pieces here. So what we really need to do now is solve these more complicated equations and see what comes out. Uh, I noticed there's one symbol which I did not define. Kappa is just the one form. the one form dual to the vector field V, where V is defined over here. OK, so this is this set of equations. Um, and over here, we have a similar set for the hypermultiplet. Um, in particular, you see that the auxiliary fields are equal to 0. So I, I didn't even bother introducing an optional description, although it's somewhat necessary. And then you get three other equations. Um, essentially, phi 1 is sufficiently generic, q needs to be 0, so all the hypermultiplet fields are 0, roughly speaking. Now, you find also these differential equations, um, which are obviously solved when the q is equal to 0, which was the original localization locus. Now, because over there we are changing a lot of things, you can imagine that a lot of things will change here, so we need to combine these two sets of equations and find new solutions. So that is what we should do now. The cost of you have the sum of the square, I'm talking about square, yes. up there, e to the D. Is there no way, easy way to see that? Or, it, or is there sort of a guarantee other than trial and error? Um, I'm not sure. I see. I think I did a trial and error. I see. But the structure is the same for very similar for S4, S3. Yeah, it's always, yeah, always like this. So uh, probably there is some deeper reasoning. So on the left side, the hypermultiple is reduced to this very simple thing. You're saying phi, the things in there that are complicated reduced to the very simple things down there? No, 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 no. These are four equations you need to impose. All I was saying is that if q is equal to 0, then these things are obviously satisfied. And if you set f equal to 0. So in Coulomb branch localization, I claim that all the hypermultiplet fields uh, have to be set equal to zero. This is the solution to this set of equations on the Coulomb branch locus, where the Coulomb branch locus was defined by essentially only having phi 1 non-zero and all the other vector multiplet fields equal to zero. But now we changed, we changed a bit the equations over here by having these extra terms. So it's not guaranteed anymore that over here I will find nothing. That I feel will find only the trivial solution. Oh, but you're saying before you modified it. Before I modified, the yeah. The statement was? These equations have trivial solutions. Okay. So first thing we can do, or which we can observe, which I already said in words, if we turn off this extra term I introduced in the deformation, we get back the original equations, we get back the original localization locus, which, let me just write it explicitly, was phi 2 is equal to 0, the gauge field is equal to 0, phi 1 is equal to some constant, some constant which I call small a, and your auxiliary field was equal to minus i a w i j. But now at least this relation you can easily understand from over here. If hij is equal to 0, then dij needs to be minus i phi 1 wij. And that's indeed exactly what you find here, which of course had to be true. I can always impose determined equations, and it should always be true, even if I don't have this extra term. And on top of this, of this at the north pole and south pole, we found instantons. and anti-instantons. It's okay. Let's go 
to a situation where we actually turn on HIJ. As I was telling already in response to Ellie's question, we really like to set HIJ such that this DIJ equation is morally the same as imposing the D term equations in an original, in, in just uh, original quantum field theory. The D term equations set the right hand side of DIJ equal to the moment map operator. Um, let me write that thing explicitly, maybe just in the example of U1. Uh, you can look at the paper or you can ask me for the most generic thing you're supposed to be writing here. But let me just stick to a U1 gauge group. So for U1 gauge group, I would choose Hij to be equal to minus zeta over L. Again, this W matrix. So here I introduce a parameter zeta, which you should think of as an Fi parameter. So when I impose D-term equations in, in a U1 theory, you can imagine that there's an Fi parameter around. So in this D exact, a Q exact term, I'm going to have or impose that there is indeed such an Fi term. And then I have minus I, let me just split it or maybe write it as a matrix. So the 1, 1 component is essentially Q, Q tilde. The 2, 2 component is minus Q tilde star Q star. And this diagonal component is Q, Q star minus Q tilde, Q tilde star. And the same over here, because this thing is, of course, symmetric. So this is what I will choose for Hij. Again, the motivation is that if you just look at this right-hand side, you should recognize these as vacuum equations in an n equals 2 supersymmetric theory, where this object, if you like, I could have called it mu ij, like the moment map. If you're not familiar with uh, vacuum equations in n equals 2, I just took q and q tilde, uh, which are the scalars of the hypermultiplet. So imagine or recall actually from my first lecture, the hypermultiplet is really equal to two chiral multiplets in complex conjugate representations. These two chiral multiplets, they contain complex scalars Q and Q tilde, and it's these guys that enter here. In fact, belaboring this point perhaps a bit too much, but you remember from Guido's exercise maybe that he also had a structure like this in, in his vortex string problem precisely for the same reason as we put it over here. So these are really ubiquitous expressions for vacuum equations. OK, so this is my choice. And actually, I will split this Fi parameter in a piece which I will call zeta vacuum plus zeta SW, where the SW will stand for Cyberquitten eventually. So zeta has a specific sign, and I will choose this split such that both pieces have the same sign. At the moment, this seems like a little bit ill-motivated, but you will see why I do this eventually. So I will choose HIJ to be this thing, and then with this choice, I'm going to have to solve all these equations all over again and hopefully find some nice localization locus and then eventually find a new expression for the S4 partition function in terms of this new localization locus. So, so you are, you are, you are that the U1? Well, for the example I wrote here, I just thought it was U1, but... The, 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 the final result is going to be more general? You can do it for any, any gauge group. But I'm, I'm going to insist, though, that there is a U1 factor somewhere. So other than insisting that there's a U1 factor somewhere, any gauge group will go. And how about the uh, matter representation? The matter representation can be anything it wants. You just replace this simple expression with, as I was saying, with the moment map. So I, I could write it in all generality, but it will just be a bunch of meaningless symbols. Uh, I can show you after the lecture how I would change it. What is this? I mean, <laughs>
Um, okay, I'm supposed to be finishing. Well, maybe I'll just finish here. Since the next step would be to take this choice of H, plug it in the d term equation that is trivial, but more importantly, plug it in here and see which solutions pop out. But that's like a whole, a whole spiel, so maybe I'll just stop here.